Chair. He holds the Chair of Rhetoric and Society in Europe, 1500 to 1700. Uh, Professor Fubaroli is a scholar of such distinction uh, that I can't uh, resist to give you a small insight into the number of his accomplishments and recognitions. He's uh, a member of the uh, Académie Française uh, and is the replacement of uh, Eugène Ionesco. Uh, he's a Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur. He's a member of the Academia de Vinci and has many other honors and memberships in academies in Britain, in this country, and Italy. He was a founder of the Société Internationale uh, pour l'histoire de la rhétorique and uh, a, has been a visiting professor of art at many universities in the United States, Italy, and Britain. He has a long uh, bibliography of books over a wide range of major literary, rhetorical, and art historical themes. Most recently, an anthology of uh, the Querelle des Anciens des Modernes with an introductory essay on the theme of his talk today. The subject being From Bees to Spiders, Essay, Pensée, Mémoire, Streams of Consciousness, which deals with the emergence of individual idiosyncrasy in literature. I present Professor Fumaroli. Thank you very much. Uh, in 1887, there appeared a short novel in the Revue Indépendante in Paris entitled Les Lauriers Sont Coupés, The Laurels Are Cut, which at the time was noticed only by a closed and secretive group of symbolist avant-garde writers. His author, Edouard Dujardin, was a friend and a disciple of the poet Stéphane Mallarmé and the director of the Revue Wagnerien. And uh, the, this Wagnerian background is very important because it's the, the, the melody of Wagner that all these writers were trying to rival in the French language. The publication of this novel, Vau, unavailable in France today, and like its author, uh, completely forgotten, signals a major turning point in the history of world literature. For the first time, an entire novel was written in the form of an inner monologue or stream of consciousness. James Joyce, for instance, never hid the fact that the formal principle of Ulysses were inspired by Dujardin's novel. Even before the complete Ulysses was known and published, uh, but partially known already, William Carlos Williams composed the great American novel in 1923 in Paris as an essay on literary history structured in the form of an inner monologue. At his appearance on the literary scene, the inner monologue was almost immediately received as more than a new technique or a narrative form among many others. Indeed, it was welcomed as the modern and universal creative principle, one applicable to the essay form as well as to poetry, to fiction as well as to the visual arts. By the 20s of the 19th century, the Lauriers Sont Coupés had won over the literary avant-garde of the English-speaking world. Similarly, in France, the young Gide of the Cahier 
euh, d'André Walter, de Proust of Jean Santeuil, and in Italy, de Italo Svevo of Senilita, as all appropriated this modern poetic principle, each in his own way. Already in 1895, the Cartesian disciple of Mallarmé, Valéry, could present Leonardo's notebooks as an early precursor of this modernist form in his introduction à la méthode de Léonard de Vinci. By the 1910 or 1909, uh, publication of personal journals and diaries had firmly moved this new genre from its previous marginal and obscure position to the very center of the literary activity. In uh, 1918, Gide could say to Charles Dubos that the modern oeuvre existed as the ruins of the oeuvre as it has previously been known. He said, it's, uh, it may be that you are not able to write an oeuvre, but your diary itself will be one. The numerous obstacles which impede your work are in themselves the subject of your creative work. In 1887, uh, Dujardin was already pointing the way to a radical transformation in writing the novel, a genre that Valéry, for one, believed to be hopeless for the modern mind. Is uh, the laurels are cut as no plot, no suspense, no characters, no passion. On, nothing remain of the epic, idyllic, and historical heritage of the narrative fiction. The subdued voice of the narrator is directed at no one and issues from a supremely solitary self. It weaves a whimsical and fragile cloth on which to hang a collage of recurring memories, illusive projects, minute, immediate impressions and feelings, remembered conversations, fragments of letters, and unformed files. It captures the solipsistic emergence of a self-consciousness in his early stage before an imposition of the social and rhetorical mask. Everything remains blurred for nothing has yet acquired any form designed to address the outside here. The reader of this strange text discovers an idle youth amusing himself with his loveless yearning for a young stage actress who, one surmises, exploits him without seeding him anything of herself. From afar, he endows her with irresistible charms, delightedly anticipates every meeting long in advance, and turns over in his mind the rare moments of intimacy granted to him. His love, Fred Bear, at the start, is reduced to tatters over the ensuing 24 hours. Weary of the monotonous game, one can suppose, the narrator effortlessly checks it off on the, in the same manner in which Proust Schwann can calmly walk away from Odette, nothing has happened. The conversing narrator of the Laurier son coupé may be a poet, a budding modern novelist like the narrator of the Recherche, or one who may never emerge. This personal monologue confronts the reader with intimate and scattered experience of an eye, traditionally the subject of novels, 
essays, poems, in their ancient form. But such is not Dujardin's project. Instead of a novel of a poem, he prefers to evoke the earliest, the earliest stages of intimate experience when it remains inextricably bound up with the self, still unguarded, refusing, as it were, to mold itself into a clear form for public consumption, delectation, or edification. Eleven years earlier, on July a, uh, 20, uh, 28th, uh, 1866, Mallarmé has described the principle of this poetic revolution in a letter to his friend Théodore Robanel. It is this very principle that Mallarmé, the, the, the disciple du Jardin, was to apply to the novel. They were very close together, and du Jardin took Mallarmé to the representation of Wagner's opera. J'ai trouvé, I have found, the case stone, writes Mallarmé, the center where I sit like a sacred spider poised on the major threads already flowing from my soul and along which I will spin marvelous lace that I entreat with my imagination and which lies at the very heart of beauty. This was not the first time that the image of the spider was invoked to represent the modern creative principle. In a letter of February 19, 18, uh, 18, Keats writes to John Hamilton Reynolds, no, Now it appears to me that almost any man may, like the spider, spin from his own inwards his own airy citadel. The points of leaves and twigs on which the spider begins her work are few, and she fills the air with a beautiful circuiting. Man should be content with as few points to tip with the fine web of his soul and with a tapestry empyrean full of symbols for his rendering of distinctness for his luxury. And I have to say that some of the images that uh, we have seen this morning correspond so st strikingly to these lines that it is almost, uh, <laughs> almost the, the, auto the authority for what you do. Uh, in another part of this letter, kids contrast the modern spider to the ancient bee. The former prepares the revolution of modern European literature against the latter's ancien regime, a regime that Mallarmé doesn't even mention, assuming it long deceased. Irving Levin, in his exegesis of Bernini's tomb of the Barberini Pope, Urban VIII, reminds us of the rich allegorical significance of the bee in European antiquity, in European art and literature, up till the time of Keats and Mallarmé. From antiquity on, the bee represented poetry. I mean, the creative activity, I should say, uh, as well as the divine right of kings and the great chain of being, all of which are richly evoked by the bees on the poet Pope's armor and the bees Bar Bernini has abundantly strewn over the papal tomb in St. Peter's Basilica. In ancient Egypt, the bee was one of the two hieroglyphs representing the pharaoh along with the papyrus leaf and the two kingdoms of higher and lower Egypt. The hieroglyphica of Orapollo has transmitted this symbol 
to the Renaissance. Vow never uh, had Greek and Latin poetry overlooked it. In Virgil's fourth Georgic, the bees of Aristeus create a kingdom similar in his fertile unity to the div divine cosmic order warranted for Egypt by the Pharaoh. From Archilochos to Pindar on, the bee was also the symbol of poetry, synonymous with the muses, daughter of memory and link naturally to mnemotechnics, who enables the forms of divine, of divine wisdom to descend to earth thanks to the mediation of the poet. In Bernini's masterpiece, to the glory of his patron, the Pope, at once king and poet, two registers of classical symbols, that of power and that of poetry, fuse with the Christian allegorical symbols of grace and salvation, eternally victorious over sin and death. Pope Urban VIII's cultivation of the arts both as a poet and as a patron, is intimately tied to his fertile reign as a pope king. The Barberini bees, now, now also muses, are associated with the laurel leaves of Apollo. The pontiff art as ruler, like his art as poet, has not only during his reign connected heaven and earth, but has also helped salvation and freedom triumph of her uh, sin and death. If we follow Irving Levin's reading, Bernini's genius elevates the symbolism of the bee to his semantic pinnacle, comparable to that which Mallarmé carries the image of the spider two centuries later. The inventive genius of Bernini was able to synthesize and employ all the classical and Christian meanings of his grand, if traditional, symbol of the bee to create his powerfully original work by drawing on latent meanings as well as current ones. Mallarmé's genius, instead, soon followed by that of his di 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 disciple, Du Jardin, was to make the spider the symbol of the creative emancipation of the modern artist and poet, an emancipation from the external and objective wealth of Christian humanist commonplaces, of the divine order of the cosmos, of Christian salvation, and traditional genres linked to that heritage. The poet-artist must no longer strive to console humanity in the face of a crumbling order with an illusory wisdom that supposedly derives from divine forms and imposes itself upon the religious and political community. The laurels has been cut, and in that the title of Dujardin is very deep because it goes to the heart of the symbolic situation, the bees are dead, and the modern spiders, freed from their antiquated poetics, can descend deep into themselves in order to discover the subjective principle of modern beauty at its very source. Still in its birthplace, it nestles deep within, now not outside, le moi, the self. Malarmé spider web is modern creativity itself, for the spider pulls true beauty out of the void and rejects all honey and wax that claim to signify and affirm something beyond themselves. In 1803, the British poet Keats offered a much less radical and much more evasive version of his contention, Van Deus Malarmé, in, uh, uh, in 67. 
at the height of the quarrel of the ancients and the moderns, which began, as everyone knows, in 1687, Jonathan Swift attacks the French moderns just as sharply as his Irish compatriot, Edmund Burke, would attack the French Jacobin in his 1790 Reflections of the Revolution of France, the same English conservative Tory tradition. Swift and his satire, The Battle of the Books, written in 1697, with a fictitious fable purportedly by Aesop. This fable associates the image of the bees with the ancients and the spiders with the moderns. The two families of insects, hieroglyphs, represent two incompatible aesthetics, two incompatible political beliefs, two incompatible world views. They are diametrically opposed. The bees forgetting their own needs, forgetting their own eye, take the nectar formed by celestial dew from the various flowers and transform it in honey and wax to bestow on humankind the softness and light which they were sorely lacking. Like the muses, daughters of memory, the bees become mediators between the order of the universe and humanity. If necessary, they are also able to protect this softness, light, and order from their enemies with their impressive stingers. So the satire, so the polemics is not alien to the work of the bees. Swift spiders, ferocious individualists and atheists, care nothing from their common lot. They reject the precious gifts offered by heaven and by memory, just as they reject all duties involving the human world. They select only the rotting filth of their innards in order to weave an abstract web that in turn becomes a mortal trap for unfortunate souls on which to the selfish and ferocious spinners feed. You know what black idea uh, this conservative mind has of the modern uh, budding creative principle. In one compares Swift's spider to that of Mallarmé, one can see to what extent the modern poet has turned this symbol on its head. The spider, an insect, by the way, omitted by Renaissance antiquarians in, ven, in their an, emblem books. You don't find never the spider in the emblem books. And God knows how many uh, animals and how many symbols they use. Becomes a monster for Swift. Mallarmé instead glories in the spider's freedom, seeing in it an expression of the modern self emancipated from all vested interests, literary, social, poetic, and religious, and capable of descending into itself to create pure, disinterested beauty. Donc, uh, far from any social, political, and even literary uh, utility, totally disinterested, to descend, that is, and via, there is the first influence of Buddhism in European literature, uh, Balarmé was interested in Buddhism, and when he speaks of the self, he, does, he doesn't say moi, he says soi. It means the, hat, the, the Buddhist Atman, the unformed essence of the created world. After a profound crisis of the poet has emerged an atheist, espousing the, budding, the Buddhist notion of the intermingling play of matter, 
void, and illusions. A greater misunderstanding cannot be imagined between the two versions of the symbol. While Mallarmé's spider web is a marvelous creation, uh, ex nihilo, that of swift spider is visceral film. Similarly, Honey and Walks for Swift represent the Christian literary tradition that is nourished by the memory of antiquity and nourishes humanity in turn. In contrast, Mallarmé's revolutionary aesthetics strive for a pure beauty by destroying and abolishing all earlier types of form and forms of poetry, beginning with that of the verse. This destruction paves the way for Dujardin, whose inner monologue wanders among the strewn wreckage of past genres and narratives, forms, and the detritus of characters and emotion. Can be seen on that way, can be seen as an emerging innocence of the world before any uh, social. Uh, imposition of a form. Between 1860 uh, and uh, uh, 1900, a period running for Manet, great admirer and portraitist of Mallarmé, as, as we know, to Picasso and Braque, artists wrought a similar Copernican revolution in several stages slowly shifting the creative principle of art and poetry away from the objective periphery and metaphysically ob objective, naturally, and towards the subjective core. There is an intimate relation between the sketch, the subject of this symposium, and the artistic revolution of the 60s and the uh, beginning of the 19th century, out of which emerged the literature and modern art of the 20th century. The revolutionary progress between, naturally, uh, commas, made by modernist writing and uh, arts depend upon a shared, what I should call, arachnian principle, <laughs> the denigration of received forms, be they models, design, genre, preserved in conventions and tradition and bequeathed to later generation and the privileging of unpublished, unf unfinished, original, open-ended, promising, ineffable scheme emanating from the inner depth of the self and preferably from the inner soul in the sense of Mallarmé which owe nothing to previous vision and invention, and thereby reveal the human creativity buried deep within. Like all revolutions, the poetic and artistic focus did not suddenly shift from the exterior world to the interior self. The object of artistic activity only gradually turned away from the socially defined self, encored in the objective order of the divine towards the subjective inner being or impersonal self whose creative power are self-contained. If historians of Baroque art and architecture, such as Henry Millen and Irving Levin, uh, convene uh, a symposium on the sketch, it is because for them, in my view, the genealogy of the modernist revolution goes back at least to the 17th century, a time, at a time, it must be noted, of modern mathematics has been invented, and when the ruins of the ancient world, for the first time, became a genre in the paintings of Jean Le Maire. Uh, and in the case of Bernini, like that of Borromini, a bizarre clinamen is at work within the traditional forms, tormenting the models, canons, and genres inherited from classical antiquity and the high Renaissance, as if they received shapes, even the most monumental, 
uh, were possessed by a disruptive force, the Augustinian theology of liberty and uh, salvation, the eye of the confessions. To return to Irving Levin's example, we can see that at the very moment at which Bernini is reaffirming the Greek chain of being up and down those links, the pontifical bees clamber like the angels on Jacob's ladder, the artist is also fashioning a funerary monument, one that challenges all earlier conventions with its articulation of emotional, agitated, even polemical content. In effect, Bernini's monument rests on an oxymoron, that of a theology of salvation and liberation contained within an architectonics of a cosmic and political order. It is not by chance that the terracotta abozzi of Bernini, bearing his actual imprint, were already being collected and preserved in the 17th century, as were his whimsical drawings originally known as private jokes or exercises. I would nevertheless like to stress that the tension found in Bernini's pontifical uh, monument, so well analyzed by Irving Levin, does not offer a contradiction in and or of itself. Rather, it achieves a typical Catholic synthesis between freedom and order, between the inspired genius and the community of faithful the artist represents. The abozzo of Bernini is only half of his artistic Catholic self, and his other half emerges in the monument he created to mark the center of public life for both Rome and the church. The spider's moment has not yet come. And I should say, because I have to, to restrain myself, um, <laughs> that I think that even Montaigne, Pascal, uh, are always, uh, in fact, uh, taken in the traditional world of bees. And that the first that go out of this world is an Augustinian or an hyper-Augustinian offer. It is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And I read, at least if you allow me to read this extraordinary passage, uh, the beginning of the reverie when he said, I am now alone on earth, no longer having any brother, neighbor, friend, or society other than myself. But I, detached from them and from everything, what am I? That is what remains to me to seek. I consecrate my last day to studying myself let me give myself up entirely to the sweetness of conversing with my soul. And so his last work is this descent in wars, that is the beginning of modern uh, literature. And I shall not uh, 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 develop what I should have developed, the evolution from, from memoirs, uh, <laughs> uh, from... Uh, private uh, diaries, uh, etc., etc., towards, naturally, the, mon the monologue interior. The, the, uh, and I shall conclude with a sort of, uh, of uh, suggestion. Perhaps one of the tasks of future historians of both literature and the arts will be to reconstruct in an impartial and comparative way the old aesthetics of the bees in order to compare it to the modern uh, aesthetics of the spiders. They are, in my view, as legitimate the one as the other, and, uh, uh, and to do so, namely, without the naive assumption that the modern uh, view is superior to the view of the ancient bees and have eventually progressed beyond them as the web has progressed beyond the Republic of Arts and Letters.
Thank you very much.